I think about three of you are awake, so this will be fun. Well, it's Twin Day, and uh, for you that were here last week, I shared with you my Twin Day picture, and so this will be a little bit of review for you, but I didn't want to uh, withhold uh, for our new students. So, in uh, Twin Day of 1995, that's what I look like, so. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> You know, I expect comments like that from this side of the room, but not from that side of the room. <laughs> All right, well, if you can't figure it out, I'm not going to tell you. What uh, did she play? What did you she played the oboe. Oh, yes. Her name was Megan. Oh, she was kind enough to be my twin. And back then we did twin day at dinner, so things were uh, different then. Well, enough of that. How many of you have ever said, that's not fair? All right. We have all been there. A lot of times it's when our parents were letting us know what was going to happen, right? And we said, Mom, that's not fair. All right? Within all of us is wired, I think, this idea or sense that things should be fair. And we expect fairness. Now, my sister and I, when we grew up, we, we wanted things to be fair, particularly me. I, I wanted things to be fair. And our mom would make this little like cheese pie thing, you know, and, and put the cherries on top. I think it was just the one out of the box. But we loved it when we were kids. But I insisted that the cherries on top be counted <laughs> to make sure that they were even. Because there was no way that she was going to get eight cherries and I was only going to get seven because that wouldn't be fair. We've all dealt with unfairness in life. But this morning what I want to dive into as we continue to think about living for the glory of God is, is what do we do and how do we handle life when not only does life seem to be unfair, but we feel like God has been unfair with us. We talked last week on Friday about storms and sometimes when we go through storms in life, when we go through trials or we go through difficult or hard things, we're tempted to feel as though God isn't being fair to us. That he's allowing other people to have it so easy and for us to have it so hard and it doesn't seem fair. Or he's allowing good things to happen to others and for us it seems like he doesn't act. I remember when I was in college and, and going into grad school and I was single and all my friends were engaged or married and I was wondering, God, why aren't you letting me have someone? This isn't fair. I get up every morning and I do my devotions, all right? I go to class. I'm, I'm doing all the right things, God, so why would you not give me what I'm asking for? And I felt like God was being unfair. I just didn't realize my wife was five years younger than me and I had to wait a little longer. <laughs> But what can happen when we feel like God isn't being fair is we can become bitter. And Mr. Haynes mentioned bitterness on Sunday night during introductions. And he had no idea that I was planning on speaking about bitterness this morning. But I want to talk about bitterness. Bitterness is this. It is anger, hurt, or resentment caused by one's bad experiences or a sense of un just treatment. It's something that causes mental anguish, it causes torment, and it does this. It prevents us from living for the glory of God. If we have bitterness in our heart, if we have bitterness in our soul, and sometimes it's lodged in there and we don't even realize what it is. But if we have bitterness in our life, it's going to prevent us from living for the glory of God. It can hide in our hearts, we can try to get rid of it, but sometimes it just seems to follow us. Even uh, from a secular point of view, we know that bitterness is a problem. Uh, I looked up on the Mayo Clinic's website a little information about bitterness. And, and this is what they said, bitterness will cause high blood pressure, stress, it can lead to substance abuse, it has a toxic effect on our bodies. And not just on our physical bodies, but the Bible says bitterness has a toxic effect on our soul. Bitterness leaves you in spiritual anguish. It chokes your walk with God. It affects your life, but your, not only your life, but your family, your community. Hebrews chapter 12 says this in verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. 
Bitterness is something that can affect all of us at some point or another because all of us are wired with this sense that life should be fair and there's things that happen in life, there's moments that come that make us think, you know, God isn't fair. You know, it's one thing when your sister gets an extra cherry, right? But it's a whole other thing when you think God isn't being fair to me. And if we think that, if we believe that, we can become bitter. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I hope you do, turn to Psalm 73. We're just going to spend most of our time there this morning. But in, in, in Psalm 73, and, and really in all the Psalms, we get a unique insight uh, into our own lives. Because all the other books of the Bible are written either to a specific group of people or to a specific situation. And it's valuable. It's God's Word to us. But in the Psalms, we get to experience the people of God, David and others, expressing their heart to God. We get a, we get a, a window, a look into people's relationship with God, how they express their feelings to God. And you know, it's really important that we learn how to express our feelings with God. And God can handle your emotions. He can handle your feelings. He can handle the fact that you feel as though He hasn't been fair. But I want you to see how to properly handle that so that your heart doesn't become bitter. Psalm 73, it's a psalm written by Asaph. And Asaph was a worship leader. He was a musician. He was a godly man, but he had a deep struggle. And we know godly people have deep struggles. The Christian life is not always neat and tidy. Sometimes it's really messy and sometimes it's a really big struggle. And so I just want us to work through some of what Asaph shares and then make some conclusions. But it says this beginning in, in verse 1 of Psalm 73 as we look at, at this psalm that, that Asaph wrote. He says, Truly God is good to Israel. And so right away, he's beginning by saying, truly, I, I believe, in my heart, I believe God is good. I, I grew up with that th theme work. I've known the scriptures. I believe God is good to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled and my steps had nearly <coughs> slipped. Asaph was in great despair. He was going through a really hard situation. And he says, I was at the point of despair. My feet had almost stumbled. My steps had almost slipped. And then he goes on and he describes what's going on. Because he says, I feel like life is unfair. And I feel like God has been unfair. That's his crisis. His thing that he's going through, his struggle at this point, is that he believes and feels that God has been unfair to him. And he's going to describe it for us. He says, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He said, I was envious of the arrogant and the prosperity of the wicked. He says, other people are getting ahead. They're not even following God. They're not even living for God. And everything in their life seems to be so good. Look at what he says. He says, for they have no pangs until death. No health problems. They're healthy. And yet they don't honor God. Their bodies are fat and sleek. Now evidently, that was in style back then, alright? <laughs> now literally, what that means is it means that they were healthy and strong. Alright? He says, they have good health. They're not in trouble, verse 5, like others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Remember we talked about words yesterday? He says, these people don't regard God in their words. They, they talk with malice, with evil. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. He says these people are healthy, they're prosperous, they never get sick, they're wealthy, they're proud, they're arrogant, they're boastful. Verse 10. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? 
Is there knowledge in the Most High? Not only are these people arrogant and, and all these things, but they don't acknowledge God. And if they do acknowledge God, they're like, well, if there is a God, He doesn't know what's going on because we are living wickedly and getting away with it. No trouble, no pain, no problems. They don't believe in God. Look at what else he says. He says, Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. They're getting wealthy too. Have you ever looked around and felt like you were trying to live for God, you're trying to do the right thing, and you're having this struggle while people around you who don't care about God aren't trying to live for God, and everything seems to be going perfect for them? Have you ever been there? Anybody? That's where Asaph is. And he is struggling. He's envious. Because his situation is different than theirs. And he feels like God has been unfair. And look what he says as we get sort of to the heart of the issue in verse 13 and 14. He says, All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. He says living for God, it just doesn't seem to be worth it. He says it's in vain, it's empty, it's meaningless. Living for God isn't worth it. And this is Asaph sharing his heart with God. This is his feelings, what he was going through. God can handle your feelings. He says it's all in vain. Living for God isn't worth it. He says, my mornings are filled with trouble. My life is filled with pain. Instead of joy and happiness, I have sorrow and pain. And this shouldn't be because I'm living for God and they're not people, God. Have you ever felt like that? All right, that's called karma, by the way. It's totally inconsistent with God's word. All right? I know karma is very popular in your generation. It's a myth. Karma is this idea that there's this active force, and if you send good out, this active force of good will come back, and if you send bad out, this active bad will come back. Now, the Bible talks about sowing and reaping, and that's a very important concept, but good things don't always happen to good people, and bad things don't always happen to bad people. And this left him envious, and as we're going to see, bitter. And Asaph was a spiritual leader. He was a worship leader. All right, he loved God. He was living for God. He was serving God. Even godly people have deep struggles. If you have a struggle with bitterness, I want you to know that it doesn't mean that you're not godly. It doesn't mean that you don't love Jesus. But I want you to know that, that God wants to deliver you from that because it will ruin your life. If you try to figure life out, it's never going to make sense. If you try to figure life out, it will never, ever make sense. Isaiah said it like this as he gives us God's word. These are God's word to us. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God says, My ways, the way I do things, are totally beyond what you can understand <clears throat> or grasp. And if we try to figure it out, <coughs> it'll never make sense. Look at verse 16, back in Psalm 73. <clears throat> Asaph said, when I thought of how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearious task. He couldn't figure it out. He couldn't figure out the God whose ways were higher than him. His ways, whose thoughts were higher than his thoughts. And look at what he does, though. He makes a really good decision. In the middle of his struggle, and in the middle of his pain, and in the middle of his hurt, Asaph makes a really, really good decision. Look at verse 17. He says, I was struggling, I was drowning, I was weary, until, verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I discerned, their end. He says, in my bitterness, in my envy, in my struggle, in the, all the feelings that I was having that God wasn't fair and God wasn't good, I went back to Him. And I went to the sanctuary. I went to the place of worship. 
And as he worshipped God, as he took his eyes off his situation and put him back on God, it changed his perspective because he says, Then I discerned their end. Look at what he says. Verse 18. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment and swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. What's he saying? He said, God is going to deal with the wicked. No one gets away with it. You know, it can be really frustrating to us if we think somebody's getting away with it, isn't it? But you know what? No one gets away with it. And it's not our responsibility to make sure that God is in control. He's sovereign. He'll take care of it. And we need to get our eyes off of everybody else and get them back on God. You know, it's so easy to play the comparison game, isn't it? To look around and think, wow, why didn't God make me good looking like that person? Or why didn't God make me talented like that person? Why am I the way I am? God, you haven't been fair. It's easy to do that. But you need to get your eyes off of others and off of yourself and back on God. And when his eyes were on God in verse 21, he realized that his heart had been bitter. Look at what it says. He says, my soul was embittered. I was bitter, God. I was bitter against you. When I was pricked in my heart, I realized this. He says in verse 22, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. He says, God, I realize now what I was feeling towards you wasn't right. And I repent of that. I turn from that. His heart was bitter and bitterness will prevent you from living for the glory of God. Bitterness will prevent you from fulfilling your purpose. And I like to think of bitterness kind of like as baggage that we carry around. You know, when we... Uh, when we flew up here, uh, we had to bring a lot of bags. You know, when you get kids, you get more bags. And getting through the airport with lots of bags and your kids and you're clumsy, all right, can be a great challenge, all right? But, you know, you can deal with it because, you know, I just have to get to this counter and I can check half of these bags in and I won't have to carry them anymore, right? And you know it's only for a short time, but I would hate to have to live life dragging all those bags with me everywhere I went. But you know what happens when we have bitterness? We drag that baggage with us. And we drag it around and it weighs us down and it holds us back and it keeps us from living for the glory of God. When we look at our life and then compare it to others, we're always going to be tempted to think that God has been unfair. And when we're tempted to believe that God is unfair, we open the door for bitterness to cause us really ultimately to be angry at God. Basically what we're saying is, God, you aren't doing the right thing. You're mistaken, God. You haven't done right. But look at Asaph and look at his journey. He said, I was brutish and ignorant towards you, but nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. God never left Asaph. He was right there with them. The whole time that Asaph was feeling that way and telling God you've been wrong and God this isn't fair and this isn't right. You know as Asaph threw his little fit, God just stood there and loved him. You know my little girl as precious and sweet as she is throws fits sometimes. <laughs> and it's not fun. But it never causes me to stop loving her. It never causes me to run away. It never causes me not to be there for her. And when we have those feelings towards God, He still loves us. He still cares about us. He never leaves us. Verse 24 says, You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. Asaph came to that point. When he got his eyes back on God, he said, You know what? I realized my ignorance was foolish. My bitterness was foolish. Because God is the only thing worth living for. He's my creator, my sustainer, the one who's always with me, the one who loves me without limit and without end. And He is the only reason worth living for. 
As Gretchen shared with us last night, Jesus shines pure. He shines fair. He's more important than anything. And when we get our eyes on Him, it will help us to overcome our bitterness. Just a few things real quickly that I want to give you to help you. How do we overcome bitterness? Maybe you're dealing with it right now. Maybe it's yet that you're going to deal with it in the future and you want to jot these things down. But number one, recognize the root of bitterness. As we read in Hebrews 12, bitterness is like a root. All right. If any of you have had any experience in the garden and you've pulled weeds before, if you don't get the root, what happens? It comes back. Stronger than ever. Bitterness is like a root. And we need to deal with it. The root of bitterness is believing that God isn't fair or has not been fair with you. And we need to deal with that root. Are you harboring resentment towards God this morning? Because if you are, I want to encourage you to realize that, number two, bitterness is foolish. I mean, ultimately, it's so foolish. If you feel that way, you're saying that God is unjust and unloving and unkind. And nothing could be further from the truth. God loves you so much. The heart of the gospel is love, right? John 3.16, the verse that all of you know, most of you can memorize, have memorized it, you can quote it in your sleep, backwards and frontwards, right? For God, what? So loved. So loved the world that He gave His Son. Jesus came to this earth. He lived the life that you couldn't live. He lived a perfect life without sin. He was fully God and fully man. He came and He lived and walked on this earth. He accomplished what none of us ever will, a perfect life. He died in your place. He died a sacrificial death. He didn't deserve to die. But he willingly died for you and for me and for the whole world. Because without his death, we had have no opportunity to have our sins forgiven. But Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. He conquered death. That's what makes him different from every other religion, from every other philosophy, and from every other belief system. He came, proclaimed that he was God. He did the works of God. He had the teaching of God. His enemies knew that he claimed to be God. That's why they wanted to kill him. He predicted his death and his resurrection. He died and he rose from the dead. And he proclaimed that I am the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father. Nobody gets to God except through me. Jesus is the only way to God. Your church isn't a way to God. Chehi isn't a way to God. Having devotions aren't a way to God. Jesus is the only way to God. And if you're wondering, has God been fair? No, he hasn't. Because you deserve his wrath. You deserve His judgment. You deserve punishment. You're a sinner. The wages of sin is death. That's exactly what you deserve and it's exactly what I deserve. But God has been entirely unfair in offering you grace and forgiveness. In offering you eternity with Him and His peace and His presence in your life. Bitterness will destroy your life from the inside out. And by keeping your eyes on Jesus, by understanding how great His love is for you, no, you will not understand everything in life. Everything that happens to you will not make sense. And sometimes it will feel like God has been unfair. It will feel like God has been unkind. It will feel like God has been unjust. And you can take those feelings to God. But know that He loves you. That He cares about you. So run to God when you deal with bitterness. Run to God. Who can set you free? Run to him and say, God, I, I, I feel like you've been unfair. I feel like you've been unkind. I feel like I shouldn't be dealing with this. But God, I trust you. Based on the fact that you gave your son for me, based on the fact that, that you died in my place, I choose to trust you. I choose to trust you. Not sure what's going on with this. I didn't plug in my computer. This happened a few years ago. So just hang with me. <clears throat> Eliza Hewitt was a, a lady that lived in Philadelphia. She was a music teacher. And just like a lot of our music teachers here are from Philadelphia, she did that. She suffered a serious spinal injury and became an invalid for the rest of her life. And she wrote poetry. She wrote hymns. And even though she suffered a terrible accident that left her unable to do many of the things that she loved and enjoyed. She said this. She said, just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. 
She said, I don't understand what happened to me or why God allowed it, but I know this. When I see my Savior, it'll be okay. We have sung It Is Well at least three times, I think, in the uh, eight or nine days that I've been here. And I was thinking about that song last night. Most of you know the story of Horatio Spafford, successful businessman in Chicago. <coughs> Beautiful family, son and four precious daughters. A great fire enveloped the city of Chicago, as many of you are aware. And in that fire, he lost a lot of his wealth because he had a lot of real estate. Before that fire, a tragedy had befallen his family. His son had scarlet fever and died. And so, wanting to give his family a fresh start and a new life, they decided to move to England. He had business to take care of and so he sent his family ahead of him and the ship that they were on sank in the middle of the Atlantic. He waited anxiously for news and finally a telegram came from his wife with just two words, saved alone. His four daughters, gone. He immediately booked passage on a ship to go and be with his wife and while they were crossing the ocean, his, the captain of the ship came to him and said, we are near the place where your daughters died. And after spending some time looking out upon the sea, he went back to his cabin and he wrote those words that we sing so frequently. I'm often overcome by what he could write, especially since now that I'm a dad, I didn't understand his words before I had kids. But he said this, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. So he could say, it is well with my soul. You see, we're going to face trials in life. We're going to go through hard times. There will be times where you feel like God has been unfair or unkind. But God loves you. And if it's well with your soul, Ultimately, that's all that matters. Psalm 34, verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in Him. Would you bow your heads this morning? I just want us to spend a, a couple of moments before we rush off to the busyness and the craziness of the day. And I want to ask you a couple questions in the quietness of this moment. Has God been good to you? You deserved wrath, and He offered grace. You deserved hell, and He provided a way to heaven. He loves you. He's preparing a glorious destiny from you, for you. And so I want to challenge you. Don't waste your time on your journey here being bitter and miss the chance to live for His glory. God can heal your heart. Would you run to Him today? If you're bitter, if you're struggling with that fairness thing, just run to God. Run to Him and throw yourself upon His mercy and His grace and say, God, I felt this way, but I don't want to feel this way any longer. I want your healing and your forgiveness. David said, the Lord's my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, and my stronghold. Don't let bitterness prevent you from living for the glory of God. Father, I just pray for each person here this morning. Father, I, I know that, that many of them have experienced and are experiencing some incredibly hard things in life, harder than I've ever went through. But Father, I know that you love them. I know that you gave your Son on the cross for them. I know that you have a purpose for every trial that you allow in our lives. And Father, I pray that we would not be tempted to think that you have been unfair or unkind or unwise towards us. And Father, if we have, if there's bitterness in our hearts, Father, may we run to you this morning. And Father, may we run to you and find that you are a God who is there. A God who will forgive and heal. A God who will hold us. And Father, I thank you that you're a God who has demonstrated your radical love. So that no matter what we face in life, we can say it as well with our soul. Father, we love you. We struggle. Help us not to be bitter. Help us not to think that you're unfair. Help us to trust you no matter what. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.